This video is going to talk about how the classic diode ring double balance mixer operates. Uh, the schematic for the diode ring mixer is shown here and uh, here's the circuit that we built up that we'll go ahead and test. So before jumping right into the uh, the mixer and what it actually does we'll take a brief moment to just review very quickly the theory of a mixer and, uh, and what it's going to do and what we expect from Really it. brief mixer theory. Uh, the idea here is that we take two signals at two different frequencies and combine them using some nonlinear process, usually some form of multiplication. And why we do this is usually to translate uh, a signal at one frequency to another. And the simple math behind it is that if you take two sinusoids at two different frequencies, multiply them together, the output will basically contain energy at the difference frequency and the sum frequency. Uh, now the reality is, is that with nonlinearities you're also going to get harmonics of those two original frequencies. So in the real world you typically get some quantity times F1 plus or minus some quantity times F2. So you're going to get a number of different sums and differences of the fundamental frequencies and the harmonics. Okay. Normally you're only inter interested in one of these results. Maybe F1 minus F2 or maybe F1 plus F2. And usually what will happen in the circuit is that we'll filter some of the others away. Now, you know, again, from the math, you really can't visualize what's going on. So let's go take a look at the scope and see how multiplying these signals together gives you signals at these other frequencies. All right, we've got our, our mixer mounted up here in the vise. Got some probes looking at the local oscillator input, the LO input, and the RF input. And uh, I've got the IF input coming out here as well. So that will go right into the scope also. Uh, we're using a signal generator back here to generate signals. In this case, uh, just arbitrarily picked uh, 7 megahertz for the local oscillator, 10 megahertz for the RF. And that should give us some signals at 3 megahertz and at 13 megahertz, as well as some of the harmonics of those things as well. But let's go take a look at how these signals get formed, at least uh, from a theory standpoint first, and then we'll actually go make some real measurements on the, uh, the IF output here. And to visualize that math, we simply can use the math function in the scope to multiply our two signals together. Trace number one, the yellow trace, is my 7 MHz local oscillator frequency. And the blue trace, channel two, is my 10 MHz RF signal. And uh, if we simply use the math function, I've already kind of set it up to multiply channel one by channel two, that shows up as the red trace here. And let me turn off the other traces so it'll be easier to see. And you can kind of see now there are two primary uh, frequency components in here. We've got this lower frequency variation going on here, and that's our difference frequency. That's the 10 megahertz minus 7 megahertz or 3 megahertz uh, uh, tone or component. And we can also see the higher frequency regals on this thing that are riding up and down on that low frequency. And that's our sum frequency. That's the uh, 7 megahertz plus the 10 megahertz or the 17 megahertz signal. So uh, we can visually see how multiplying those two sine waves together gives us components at the sum and difference frequency. So as I mentioned uh, in the theory that uh, this also works for uh, harmonics of the uh, RF signal and the local oscillator signal. So if we multiply the RF signal by a square wave at the local oscillator frequency, uh, it's essentially going to give us the same thing. We're going to get those multiple sum and differences. Um, so let's, and that's kind of how this mixer is going to work. So to simulate that, what I did is I created this math expression here, which is basically taking our RF signal, channel 2, and multiplying it by this expression which is basically saying um, it's a logic expression looking at if, if channel 1 is greater than or equal to 0, that's going to be equal to 1. If channel 1 is less than 0, it'll equal to, um, that'll equal to 1. So this expression here is either going to be plus 1 or minus 1, depending on whether that local oscillator sine wave is on the positive half cycle or the negative half cycle. So this is a quick way of multiplying the RF signal by plus one or minus one at the rate of the local oscillator signal. So if we go accept this waveform and take a look at it, and let's take a look at this math waveform here. I'll shut off uh, these signals. And we can kind of see the same thing. I still have that three megahertz sinusoid going on in here, and I've got those same higher frequency components. There's a bit more 
you know, we see some fast edges in here. And this is all due to the, you know, the odd harmonic content of the square wave. But we're still left with those two fundamental components in addition to some of the others. And I wanted to point this out because this is kind of how the diode ring mixer works. So let's go take a look at that in more detail. So in the diode ring mixer, the diodes act as switches and they're driven like switches. Uh, now I've, um, I've got a nice video that I put together a while back that talked about how to use diodes as switches and I'll link that uh, video below so you can go review that. So the switches are driven by the local oscillator signal and the switches essentially alternate between two different paths or two different states in the mixer and the RF effectively is replicated or inverted at the IF port and it's you know basically multiplied by plus one or minus one at the LO rate or the LO frequency rate and here's how it works consider when the local oscillator is at or the signal is at this polarity where I've got positive up here and negative down here that's going to turn on these two diodes and turn off those two so this all appears out of the circuit because this path is turned off now what it's doing from an RF standpoint it's shorting the two sides of this transformer out and because the center tap is connected to ground and these are in series this point appears at ground so from an RF standpoint when the signal comes in here it causes the voltage to rise that same voltage is going to rise up here okay causing current to flow in this direction from ground through here and onto the load resistor so essentially we get you know current going into the load resistor in that direction when the local oscillator switches and changes polarity we're over here now and in that case these two diodes get shut off so this path gets completely taken out and we're left with these two diodes turned on again shorting out um, the same thing here so essentially this point here looks like ground so that same RF signal going in that same direction here is now going to cause current to flow out of the phasing dot here to ground so that means the current is flowing up this way and in the other direction through the load resistor so we can see the switching action of the local oscillator basically causes a change in polarity or uh, inversion of phase of the RF signal appearing at the load. So that's essentially our multiplying of plus one and minus one. And that's how the uh, diode ring mixer works. One more thing that's interesting to note is that um, in either of these two states, only one half of the winding is used on the RF uh, transformer here. So it really isn't a, a 4 to 1 transformer, it's really just a 1 to 1 transformer with the other half not being used. We're just switching which half of that transformer is being used during each half cycle of the local oscillator signal. Alright, so let's take a look at the uh, local oscillator output. That's over here on channel 3 on the scope. So if we turn the channel 3 trace on here, let me do a single capture here, and uh, I'll turn off again channel 1 and channel 2, and we see that same action going on here. We've got that low frequency component. There's our difference frequency. Uh, so that would be the 3 megahertz component. And I've got those higher frequency wiggles on there. So it looks a little bit different than the math waveform, but uh, it really there's a good reason for that. So uh, let's go compare the two, and then we'll take a look at why they're different. So let's turn on uh, the math trace uh, that's multiplying it by the plus and minus 1 square wave and uh, what I'll do is I'll change the vertical scale here to make them about the same and let me just adjust the offset up so I can actually see these two waveforms together now the biggest difference is that uh, instead of getting these really sharp transitions here during you know, the time where things are switching the analog waveform we're getting out of the mixer is kind of settling out to kind of zero in between and well there's actually a good reason for that and it goes back to the way the circuit is designed so if we look at the circuit, um, these diodes are being switched on or off by essentially a sine wave that's coming through the secondary of this transformer. Now of course the diodes have got some finite turn on voltage, so as the, the sine wave here is, is crossing through zero, there'll be a period of time when all the diodes are off, and then you have to get a sufficient bias across uh, this ring for the pair of diodes to turn on. So when we did the math in the scope, we just instantaneously switched between plus and minus one. In the case of the real diode ring mixer, there's going to be a little bit of a dead time while the local oscillator is swinging through zero, while all the diodes are off. And that's what, why we get kind of the little flat spots, you know, at the switching times in the, uh, the actual local oscillator output, excuse me, uh, IF output.
had to prove that to ourselves that the diodes are switching off, let's uh, look at our uh, IF output and turn on channel 1. And we can kind of see that these flat spots are all coinciding with when the local oscillator signal is crossing through zero. So that kind of shows us that uh, we're not switching instantaneously between multiplying between plus and minus one. There's a small period of time where we're essentially multiplying by zero. Uh, but in the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. What it's going to do is increase the, num the magnitude of some of the higher order mixing products. And we can see that if we look at it on the spectrum analyzer. So let's take our uh, IF signal out of channel 3, stick it into the spectrum analyzer here, and we'll run things here and turn the spectrum analyzer on. Okay, and now we can actually see the various frequency components that we're getting out of this mixer. Now again, we're putting in a 7 megahertz local oscillator. There's that component right there. We've got a 10 megahertz RF signal, that's that component right there. So th that's just leakage coming through from the, the, the two inputs to the mixer. Our, our, the largest two components are here and here. And these are our difference frequency, that's 3 megahertz. That's the uh, difference between our RF and LO. And then this one here at 17 megahertz is the sum of our LO and our RF signal. And those are the two components that were, one of those two is typically the one we'd be interested in. So I also see our fundamental input signals here, but I've got this other one here relatively strong at 11 megahertz. And where did that come from? And the, really what that is, if we take um, our local oscillator, remember we're doing it essentially like a square wave, so we're gonna have a lot of odd harmonic com uh, content. So if we take the third harmonic of this, that's 21 megahertz. 21 megahertz minus 10 is 11 megahertz. So that's where that guy came from. And some of these others you can get through some of the other combinations, but they're down pretty far. But generally, one of these two, the sum or the difference, is the one we're typically interested in. And in a, a re real receiver application, we'd probably have a bandpass filter around one of those in order to uh, select the, the component that we want. Now, one thing that's important with these diode ring mixers is that the IF output, even though you may only be interested in one component or the other, you want to ensure that the IF output has got a good termination for all of the components that are coming out of it. So a nice broadband termination before you go do a filter. Otherwise, that these unwanted components that are here might reflect back into the mixer and reconvert to other components. So um, now this thing is, again, wide open. We didn't do any shielding. We didn't do anything special to really improve the isolation or match the diodes. So we're going to get uh, you know quite a bit of components in here. But the idea was, as you can see where these components come from, we can see mathematically where they came from, and you can also see graphically on the scope screen where they came from. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Got a little better understanding of how the classic double balanced diode ring mixer works. And uh, go play around with it yourself. Thanks again for watching.